And, uh, my name is Anthony Bresnikan. I'm a film and television writer for Vanity Fair. And I've been spending a lot of time recently uh, working on a project that unravels the whole timeline of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I feel a lot of, a lot of uh, kinship with the TVA and, and Miss Minutes especially. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank you for, for coming out, for watching the screening. Uh, it's a different experience on the big screen, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I want, please join me in welcoming uh, our special guest today. I'll begin with Loki himself, executive producer of the series, Tom Hiddleston. The director and executive producer, Kate Heron. <laughs> Head writer and executive producer, Michael Waldron. <laughs> and composer, Natalie Hull. <laughs> See, welcome, welcome everyone. Thanks Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Thank you all for coming out on a Sunday afternoon to, uh, <laughs> to see our work. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could walk us back. Some, some, you've probably answered this already, and some people may already know, but I, I know a, a lot of planning goes into the creation of the Marvel Universe, and you've been on that ride now for more than a decade. Uh, when did you learn that this would be... Uh, Loki's next step. Of course, you, you met your end in this episode. He watches yes. his demise at the hands of Thanos. Uh, yes. But did you believe that that was the end for Loki, or did you know? <laughs> no, truthfully, I thought it, the, at, uh, the end of Infinity War, or rather the opening of Infinity War, was the end of my journey. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a great surprise um, and a great delight um, when... Uh, Luis de Esposito and Kevin Feige called, um, I think it was around the spring of 2018. And it was actually before the public launch of Disney Plus, but Marvel knew obviously what was going on and they were very excited by the opportunity to tell more stories. And Lewis and Kevin said one of the first ideas they had was to, um, for Loki to have his own story. So they called me up and I said, my first question was, well, what are we gonna do <laughs> about Infinity War? Um, but, they, but there was a plan, um, as there always is. Um, and one of the most exciting things was, so that was spring of 2018 and we had uh, two years really before we started production to, to generate, to come up with the idea and expand on it and add and imagine and dream and pitch and, and think about all the th different things that we could do with the character, different stories we could tell. Um, so it, was a, it ha has been a long journey. Where are we? 2022, four years ago. Yeah. Well, well, can you share what some of those variants would have been? What were some of the more, was it always geared in a similar direction or were there really very different storylines that might have followed Loki after he disappears with the Tesseract? Well, one, one, that was the clearest cornerstone, I remember that, that Kevin Feige said, we will start where Endgame leaves off. Loki picks up the Tesseract, disappears in a puff of smoke. Where? Where does he go? How does he get there? When does he go? And um, I remember the thing that excited a lot of people was this idea of the, the TVA, the Time Variance Authority, um, institution that claims to govern reality and the order of time. And that was, a, I found a fascinating starting point because Loki's god of mischief and chaos, unpredictable, spontaneous, and full of his own free will. And he comes up against this institution that um, tells him everything is predetermined order versus chaos, <laughs> story starts there. So that was really exciting for me. And um, I think something else we agreed on was, how best to tell this succinctly, um, take Loki out of his comfort zone, strip him of everything that 
was familiar. Strip him of Thor and Odin and Asgard and the Avengers and allow the story to exist in in Loki flavors. Um, and also challenge the character with um, himself and show him a mirror and break him down and rebuild him and, and um, uh, put him on the back foot. More vulnerability, more confusion, more doubt, more questions. Um, huge opportunities for, for story. So Kate and Michael... What was the order of your uh, joining this project? Uh, Michael, were you on first? Were you writing it first? And then Kate, I know you, you, you created a document that is kind of famous now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I was on first and had written, we'd done, I guess the first, we'd done the 20 weeks of the writer's room and written the pilot. Um, and we had early drafts of all the episodes um, and we'd invented time travel, uh, and all those rules were perfectly airtight and figured out. Uh, and, and then we had the great benefit of when Kate came in in the process, it was her genius, fresh eyes, um, coming in, not having all of our institutional baggage <laughs> of, of, everything we'd been thinking about um, while cr we were creating this stuff. And so she really helped us refine it and was a huge part of not just the filmmaking, but even the rewriting process as I was revising, you know, the entire season. Mm -hmm. Kate, what were some of the ideas that you think got you the, the job? Oh, Lord. Um, I think, to be honest, like, I knew I was a wild card going in because I asked my agent, I was like, can you just keep calling them and calling them and eventually they'll meet me. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know who else you guys met, but I just knew they were like big dogs. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna give them everything from my brain. And I think the PDF was, oh God. It changes every time I talk about it, which makes it even more mysterious. <laughs> but I think it, it was genuinely at least over 100 slides, but it was everything like architecture, uh, story stuff, uh, casting. I mean, everything, everything. So yeah, I just I just went for it, really. I mean, I guess one thing, am I holding this too close to my mouth, by the way? I don't know, I'm not no. normally speaking on a microphone. I am, uh, <laughs> but I am. Um, I, I, okay, so like the time theater, for example, I thought it would be cool, because I love Minority Report, if rather than cut to like clips from Loki's life, if we put them on a stage and Minority Report, the connection is because there's a really beautiful moment in that where Tom Cruise's character, he sees his wife who's passed away and she's this full 3D projection, right? But it's really painful because he feels like, you know, she's there with him, but she's not there with him. And I, I love that idea, and you steal from the best, right? <laughs> so I was like, well, let's take that and put that on a stage so it's like Loki is watching a play of his life. Um, so that's one of the ideas that, yeah, got into the show. And then I would say beyond that, like so much of it was like collaborative among all of us, you know? Like I think one thing I loved about it and that, you know, Michael and me connected on and Kevin Feige was always encouraging us, right? He was like, go weirder, go bolder. And we'd be like, okay, we thought the alligator was weird, but great, <laughs> we'll keep going. Um, they and get I, much weirder than the uh, Loki alligator. <laughs> yeah, because I remember like that was in, like when I got the job, like, you know, Michael and his team had come up with that. And I was like, this show's crazy, like, that's great. So. That kind of set the bar for like anything is possible. So I think all of us as a team, you know, we we're always like, how can we make this, you know, the clearest but also most ambitious telling of the story we want to do? Was that a guiding principle for you? Uh, Tom mentioned, you know, stripping Loki of all of his familiar items, the people in his life, even his clothes. I mean, he loses his <laughs> he loses his green cloaks and <laughs> uh, is in this. Uh, uniform, this sort of uh, generic uniform. But, but you've also taken a character who thinks of himself as a god, ha exists in this celestial plane, and you've stuck him in this institutional bureaucratic place, which seems he seems to not fit into. And I wondered if just going the opposite direction from what Loki would be used to was 
was one of the things that just you could always rely on for inspiration. Mm. Any of you, would you like to jump in on that? Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, that, that was, I, I think Tom said it best. It, every step of the way, how can we take Loki out of his comfort zone? And really, I think that was even the philosophy in just the inception of the show, that, that we didn't want to do anything with this character that had been done before. You know, Loki had been in several movies. He had had sort of a complete arc to some extent, a, a redemptive arc at least. And so we felt like we had to find new ground to cover for him. Um, and yeah, that, I, I think that that, uh, <clears throat> that was our process, just taking him out of his comfort zone. A show about identity in lots of ways. One of Kate's um, extraordinary, I guess it was, we talked about it so much, right? That it was about confrontation with self. And if you break, we just wanted to break Loki open, break him down and confront him with all his patterns of behavior, um, all the knowledge through which he's uh, he conceives of himself as high status and and ask the question who are you who do you think you are and who might you be revealed to be it's an amazing dramatic question is um, in a way that show is about exploring the disparate fragments of his self and trying to integrate them into a whole. He can try to find which parts of himself he wants to keep after it's all been um, fragmented in some way. Um, it's a great parable in a way, this use of variance and, and what our first meeting, Kate's, my first meeting with Kate, I said, what do you think it's about? And she said, I think it's about self-acceptance, which was very new as a flavor. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, it's like, they're both very articulate, and I'm like, yes. Um, <laughs> like, what they said. Uh, but no, I, I think that, yeah, for me, I thought that was really beautiful, because, like, you know, I love Marvel, I love big genre storytelling, but the stories I go back to that are in those worlds, I, I always think, you know, if you strip away all the bells and whistles, like, what's it really about? And for me, like, I'm always driven by emotion and the truth of having that, so, like... For what we were talking about, I would say like, okay, so like episode five, for example, so that's our one in the void with multiple Lokis. And you know, Tom's Loki by that point has been on such a journey and in such a different emotionally, like a completely different space. But that was the fun with picking which Loki should he meet, right? And then with classic Loki, it's like, you know, goes to Christmas future and then you've got kid Loki, like goes to Christmas past. And I, I think, you know, all of us, like the team, like Michael and everyone, we were excited by that because it was like, yeah, again, it just comes back to that central question, like what makes a Loki a Loki? So I think we were always interrogating that across every episode. And then obviously with Sylvie, <laughs> like, you know, what's nature, what's nurture, how are they similar, how are they not similar? Well, I think it's a really interesting way to explore a narcissist. Wouldn't you say he's a narcissist? Is that too far for Loki? Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> in some senses, yes, I'm sh absolutely, yes. It's like, you know, enough about you. Loki wants to talk about himself. And, and this reminds me a little, as you're describing it, like that scene in The Breakfast Club when uh, the character describes being locked in the closet when he's caught with cigarettes and he has to smoke all of them. You know, smoke up, Johnny. Like, you... Yeah. Loki, you're, you know, you're obsessed with yourself, like, have a lot of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Blow yeah. out all the circuits. That's true, yeah, that's true. And, and, how, much of, and how much of that can you take, um, in a sense? Um, and I think also what I loved was that through, through the character of Mobius, so perfectly and brilliantly played by Owen Wilson, there's this, quite right, <laughs> um, there is a somebody across the table who isn't emotionally entangled. It's not Thor, it's not Odin, it's not anyone who's going to be provoked or drawn into Loki's tricks. He's just this dispassionate observer who's also got this academic curiosity about Loki, like someone who studied Loki in the wild and finally he's got Loki in front of him. 
this is amazing. You're doing that Loki thing that you do. Um, and, so that, and so Loki's never seen that detachment before. And, and the whole thing is a new, uh, is new territory, so new questions. His interrogation felt to me, as I was watching it just now, a little bit more like a therapy session. Yeah, Why do you do this? Analysis, yeah. Well, he, he deploys something against Loki that I don't think Loki's ever really encountered, which is genuine patience. That's what's so interesting about that relationship to me is that um, he listens and he and he, there's he's in fact not judging Loki and I think Loki spent his life feeling judged, being judged rightfully or wrongly, um, and out of that patience, a really beautiful friendship grows. It's family members and Avengers are impatient yeah. in Loki's history. <laughs> All of this is just, is just background so that we can talk about Natalie Holt's amazing score on this series. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, there's, there's so many wonderful themes. Uh, I was refreshing just listening to them separately from watching the show uh, on the drive here. And, and I wondered if we could talk about your influences. And one of them is clearly time. You know, you have the, the sound of a, a ticking clock in that opening theme, but also the big, the big sounds. Forgive me, I'm using layman's terms here, but the big, brassy sounds. I'm like, wow, this could almost be like the, the, the chime of a of a clock that lords over a town. Like, can you talk to me about those influences and how you turned them into music? There's already a natural rhythm to time. Um, yeah, I definitely um, experimented with using clocks and running them through um, analog tape machines and speeding them up and slowing them down. Um, and that was kind of something which was in the background of the TVA theme. Um, but I think, because obviously when you come to a job, you usually just read the script and you don't know who's playing it and you know I came to the script and I knew it was Tom and I'd see I'd got so much to go on and I felt so inspired by his performance and I felt like there's something Shakespearean and theatrical about it and over the top and flourishing and I wanted to draw on on classical repertoire and Wagner and Mozart and opera and <clears throat> and so the use of these enormous low-end forces in the orchestra felt really appropriate. Like, go big. You're, you're telling a huge story. You've got a big character. Um, and it was really fun to have that ginormous canvas. <laughs> like, you know, because I'd come from a world of doing quite small BBC dramas with, you know, intimate drama, which you can't impose a massive score on. So it was fun to be able to go big with this. There are those big movements in, in the score, but then also interwoven with these very delicate, small themes, almost like a music box that's playing while these great, huge, uh, 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 gargantuan sounds are going off. Can you tell me about blending those two and, and w what you think that adds <coughs> to the emotion of the, the story? I sp so when I m met Kate for my interview for the job, um, I sort of said something about... Um, Clockwork Orange score, Wendy Carlos, how you hear Beethoven, but it's played on a synthesizer. So it's got the scale, but it's also unusual because you've not heard it in that way before. Um, and that, for me, that score, Clockwork Orange, was very um, inspirational. And so there, were, there was lots of... I was going big with, with the actual orchestra, but I was also using lots of synths and um, 70s analog retro synths as well. And we talked about the kind of palette of the look of the show. And I was, I was mentioning these things just right from the get-go. And I think that, that we kind of bonded on that sound and the sound of the theremin as well. Um, and that was in your pitch, wasn't it? That the, and I just worked with a theremin player. So it was just so fun to kind of, you know, there's so much going on in this story. It's, it's so vast. And to be able to kind of incorporate all these different musical kind of nods as well was really fun. So, so you mentioned the classical influences and, and the, but combined with the synths and at 70s rock music. So was prog rock or like new wave an influence on you too? Because I, I felt a little of like Pink Floyd and Adam Hartmother and maybe the Pet Shop Boys. <laughs> 
in, in your school? Well, or am I picking up the right the flavors? In um, episode five, and, and we did a prog theme because we had time on this show as well because we had lockdown in the middle of it. So we were, we were given this gift of all this extra time to just sit with the themes and develop ideas. And then when Kate went back to shoot, I, we had the Loki theme by that point, didn't we? So you managed to take that back into into the world with you and it, it kind of grew organically. Um, so it was so nice to have all this time and to be able to replace things which would probably usually be source tracks. But we're like, oh, let's try a kind of, you know, with the D.B. Cooper, we did a samba kind of version of the Loki theme. Um, and it was just fun to, you know, we did, with the um, cartoon where he enters the TVA at the beginning, we did a sort of Bernard Herrmann-esque version of the TVA theme. So, yeah, it was great to just play around with the themes and just seed them so much yeah on your ride of the valkyries nod as well yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah that was it just i felt like it needed a flourish on the top and then valkyries oh that ties in you know it kind of ties in with the Asgard. mythology of the of the character so that was perfect uh, there is actually a little wagner ripoff in the score <laughs> you already spoke about owen wilson and, and his uh performance but another figure that it plays prominently in the TVA is Miss Minutes, who I am fascinated by. <laughs> I think everybody can see some of the real life influences there, like Clippy, right, from the Microsoft uh, products. But uh, tell me about the creation of Miss Minutes. And uh, we know ultimately, for those who've seen the end of the show, how she factors in. But at the beginning, why was she important to, to have this little animated, weird cartoon clock in the story? <clears throat> she was a cheat. Uh, <laughs> somebody had to tell you how this crap worked. <laughs> uh, and, and so in the first draft of the script, I didn't want to uh, get hung up figuring out a clever way to uh, deliver all the time travel exposition. And so I just wrote Miss Minutes. And I was like, eh, it's kind of like Mr. DNA from uh, Jurassic Park. Um, it's a real inspiring look behind the curtain. Uh, and, and, but in fact, it, um, she felt it, it really worked in giving her the uh, Southern affectation. She talks just like my wife uh, was, was, I guess, the, the inspiration for her. And, and, but there was, a, there was something perfectly uh, disarming yet sinister about her, she, she's meant to just be... I did not trust her from the beginning. Right, right, okay. Yeah, but she's meant to be uh, just sweet as pie, uh, but, but there is something just a little bit insidious going on um, that, of course, you see by the end that, yeah, she's working for the big bad. And, and so that, that was a, a really fun character that then Kate and our whole team, the way that was brought to life in animation and then, of course, voiced by the legendary Tara Strong um, to, to get applaud for her, yeah. her to do that voice. Uh, it was just so cool. Kate, did you, do you wanna, how do you direct Miss Minutes? It's different than any of your other performers. <laughs> yeah, it was, I'd never worked with a cartoon before, so. <laughs> um, but it was, it was really fun on set, because we had, like, to be honest, it was a lamp with really scary eyes stuck to it. It's a credit to our actors. Uh, <laughs> but it was, no, it was really fun and we, we wanted the style of her animation to feel even old within the TVA. Because I think that was the fun thing within the whole TVA was that like an actual office, they probably don't have maybe the latest technology and they're not gonna replace stuff if it's not broken. She does so. feel very, let's all go to the lobby, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that was the fun thing with her. And no, it was just amazing working with Tara and our animators. I mean, we had a lot of fun with her. I had a lot of fun with, I remember we put the jump scare in for her in Ep 6, which I was really obsessed with. Like, because I remember she could be sinister and I was like, oh, we got to put a jump scare in. So that was very fun to test on all the post team. Yeah. <laughs> Natalie, can you, can you tell us about your, you have a, a Miss Minutes gets her own theme and it's very jaunty. <laughs> How did you come up with it? Um, oh yeah, that, that was just kind of a, it seemed appropriate for her to do something kind of over the top and slightly 50s, wasn't it? Like, um, that was our kind of inspiration for it. But um, yeah, and then in episode six, 
the the whole tone of the score really changed and, w- and each episode felt like it had its own different color but six just i loved writing episode six i just w- didn't want it to end i, you <laughs> I just want to write more episodes but it, it was more atonal and slightly creepy and yeah it was kind of playing around with more like horror um kind of elements in in episode six so her theme the the jump scare was yeah kind of flipped on its head Scary orchestral sounds. <laughs> Tom, what's it like for you? Uh, are you an actor who can watch himself on screen, or do you prefer not to? I, I know different actors feel differently about that. Um, I mean, I, I th- at the first time I saw myself, I think like everyone, you just kind of want to crawl under the earth. Um, <laughs> but I've got used to it. <laughs> um, I've, I've kind of, I think, I hope I've learned a lot. I've tried to um, learn a lot from watching it back. Um, sometimes you can have a memory of your experience on the day and when it, maybe you go, oh, I didn't think it was going to look like that or I didn't understand the framing there. But I've, I've always um, tried to be humble enough to, to just think there's a lot to learn in, in watching it, to see where you think you hit and where you missed and all the places in between. That's why I wondered if watching it if, if you discover things that you didn't realize in listening to the music or seeing how it all fits together. Uh, Always. The synthesis of everyone's work at the end is, is genuinely thrilling, mm-hmm. um, especially as in this, um, when Loki's watching his past and his future, I was just looking at a wall. There was nothing there. So uh, it's just me imagining so it's a very strange, surreal experience because I was imagining things that I had done, but Loki hadn't done, if you see what I mean. I mean, I had done as Loki. It's going to sound weird for a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you pry someone's eye out of there? In a previous iteration, I had done these things, but this Loki hadn't done them. But yes, it was... Um, so to see the to see the reverse, to see the, the, to see the footage cut together with the... Um, with my responses, and also to see, um, to see uh, things like acting with Miss Minutes, or even the momentum of falling through trapdoors repetitively, which we did in a very old-fashioned way. I just fell out of the frame um, onto my uh, behind, <laughs> um, and or sometimes through, th- and sometimes we did a drop with wires and things like that. So yeah, it's very, it's very exciting, especially. To see it, to see the the whole, to see the tone, to see where um, where Kate and Kate and the editors are leading the audience, and also with Natalie's music, which just elevates the entire thing. Um, yeah, I was I was really proud to watch this back. Kate, you talked about Minority Report being an influence on you, and and I wondered if the Albert Brooks movie Defending Your Life was. Uh, something that you thought about or had, had seen because that it also has that uh, similar flavor of being in a uh, in the great beyond but it's a bureaucracy yeah, <laughs> and uh, true, yeah. uh, did was that movie something you thought about so that movie actually I know with the writers that was already in conversation for me I and I Michael should definitely talk more to that particular film it's an amazing movie um, but it was already kind of in conversation I would say like and I stole from like every sci-fi movie. So like uh, Alien, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, Blade Runner, obviously, um, Children of Men. I mean, basically, if there's a sci-fi movie out there, we probably stole something from it. It's sort of the rule of thumb but with our show. I mean, your life is, I mean, it's like a straight up comedy. So that's, I think yeah. that the humorous side of the TVA and the absurdity of having your life on reels, yeah. I think was kind of interesting. Michael, can you mm. talk about the, the comedy in that, in that film in particular? Yeah, we, we talked about that early on in the room. Again, we talked about science fiction bureaucracies, you know, defending your life, um, men in black, inside out. You know, there, there is a, it's almost a genre unto itself. And, and we talked about what are the good versions of that and, and what are the versions we want to steer clear of. And, and what we landed on and what I think Kate rendered so well is a world that just is very lived in and that, that isn't played for laughs that you know and, and I think we found 
maybe early outlines or even early drafts of the script were perhaps more comedic. We were maybe leaning on comedy more than we even needed to. The show came alive when we let it be a thriller, a, you know, kind of a sci-fi <laughs> police thriller. We talked about 1984 and, yeah. and, and the trial by Kafka. Mm -hmm. That thing of um, Joseph K in the trial is these men turn up and say, we're taking you for, you know, you have to stand trial. And he, and he says, for what? And he goes, well, you'll find out later. And he just never quite, never knows what he's done. He never finds out the, the truth of his crime. Or well, 1984 being, you know, I mean, it's a mm. absolute masterpiece of 20th century literature, but about an institution with a kind of malevolence or a menace or a moral ambivalence in some way. Dehumanizing. Yeah, right? dehumanizing. You get processed, everyone's a number. You know, the Ministry of Truth, mm -hmm. the Time Variance Authority, you know. It's, um, the, the biggest, on the writing side, the biggest uh, thing I, f I feel like we stole from or took inspiration from was Toy Story. Mm -hmm. um, day, day one of the writer's room, that was our big breakthrough that we wanted to end the first episode with Loki having the moment that Buzz Lightyear has when he finally realizes I am a toy, um, I'm not, not a special. space ranger. Mm -hmm. And you know, and he's down on the floor with a broken arm and that, you know, he's, he's, his reality has been completely upended. And that felt like such an exciting place to put Loki and then launch into the rest of the season from. Natalie, are there any elements of the score that you can talk about that you deliberately wrote to be sort of numbing or part of that, convey that bureaucratic, dehumanizing feeling? Um, I, I think, I don't know, I, do, I don't think there was numbing, I felt like that was already there. I don't think there was any numbing. I, I think there were things like um, when Loki sees Mobius being pruned, um, like that was a really, I felt like we really leaned into the music and there's that slow motion moment and that, that felt like, I, I just felt like I was in the character at that point, just feeling all this pain, and the music was accentuating that. And and when Loki holds the, he gives the sword to the young Loki. Like th those were kind of moments where I felt like I was expanding the emotion. Um, but I, f I felt like the kind of bureaucracy and the, you know, the numbingness was just there. It was it was in the set design, which which is another. You know, Kazra did such a fantastic yeah. job Good in the show. Mm. And the, the cinematography. Yeah, it was awesome. It's like amazing. I, I would say as well, one thing on just overall tone, like music, design, everything, like you need to believe the TVA are the good guys until at least episode four. So we weren't, you know, we have hints to like 1984, like there's posters around the TVA, like Big Brother is watching. But at the same time, like that's why you have someone like Owen Wilson, who's very warm and inviting. And you're like, oh, well, he can't be a bad guy. And you know, you know what I mean? And then as it unravels, and you have people like Wimi Mizaku, who's like an amazing actor, and she has so much warmth, and you know, her arc across the show where she realizes, oh wait, am I not one of the good guys, is like very moving. And I think that was the needle to thread really throughout the show and tonally manage was, we don't want the audience, what because we Loki's the bad guy in episode one, you know? You need to think that, oh, okay, he's now going to work with this bureaucracy, and obviously it's a bureaucracy. <laughs> um, but you can't think there's sinister things completely going on until really later on in the show, because otherwise that twist just doesn't work. Uh, Michael, you just uh, wrote the... Well, you didn't just write it, but the, the, the film Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness just came out, and uh, you wrote that script. <laughs> Jeez, thanks. Uh, can you talk to me about uh, how you became an expert in alternate universes and the, the perils, <laughs> the perils of writing that? Because you have to, I, I, I suspect you have to come up with, with rules and logic for yourself to follow for you and the other writers. But it also has to be something that the audience can follow along with, without having it overly spoon-fed to them in a way that slows the story down. So. Are those, are those the, the hazards of writing stories that uh, involve the multiverse? Uh, and how do you get around that? Yes, <laughs> there are many, many, many hazards. Uh, I have a very low threshold for boredom. 
Uh, I, I get I fall asleep easy watching anything, and I think that's that's because I'm always in in writing this stuff, especially this sci-fi stuff. I'm like, all right, when am I nodding off uh, as as somebody's explaining how timelines work? Um, and I I think that you know the way the way that we did it in this show is we in the writers' room we took our first two two and a half weeks or so and broke the general emotional arc for the season. We really did stay close to and kind of what each of the six episodes would be and feel like. And then we had to sit down and spend three weeks, which is a big bulk of your time in a 20 week writer's room and define the rules of the TVA. How did, how does time travel work according to the Time Variance Authority? Because we had to understand that so we could understand what constituted a time crime. Well, how do you break that law? So we figured all that out, developed all this institutional knowledge, and then we said, all right, how can we make sure the audience essentially never knows any of this? How can we shift it so far to the background and give them the bare minimum necessary to just get swept up in the personal, emotional story. And I think that's the trick, whether it's Loki or another character in a multiversal story. Who cares about the multiverse? It only matters if it's a interesting um, way to tell an emotional story about your character. It's cool because you can use it as a reflective tool with your characters the way we do with Loki in this, but I think that you just, it still has to be driven by emotion and, and finding humanity. And when you work with Tom and you know this cast, lucky, luckily you're able to do that pretty easily. And Tom, I went back and I found an interview you and I did more than 10 years ago and you were new to playing Loki. <laughs> okay. And you talked about some of your, we've talked a lot about influences on this show, but you mentioned like Jack Nicholson as the Joker and Tim Burton's Batman and Alan Rickman for Die Hard, in Die Hard and James Mason in North by Northwest. And you said, I loved villains who enjoy themselves. Loki's having a good time and so am I. <laughs> <laughs> and my question for you now, all these years later, all these films and stories later is, is Loki still having a good time? And it's... Or is it now time for him to pay up for his good times? Um, Loki it may be having less of a good time, but I'm having a great time. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to hear that back. Um, uh, it's, play, I wish I had one of those little devices I could you play, play it back. You can play it back, <laughs> watch it on screen, I'll have a breakdown and have to go and think about my life. Uh, you have that machine, I'm on. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I think as a child, I was always drawn to those, um, those amazing performances that you and I mention, um, cause they were all seemed to be so charismatic. They seemed to be, um, so, uh, fun. I was just drawn to them. And I, and I thought that Loki, Loki was the God of mischief. So he had to be having a great time too. The, my great privilege is that the, this go around was to was to go much deeper into the source of who he is, um, and I think it's really it was really interesting and um, strangely enjoyable to to make that deeper exploration, um, and I hope it's been enjoyable for the audience to um, see that. Thank you. But, uh, you know, it's it's so unusual. I I keep thinking this. It's so I will probably in all likelihood, never have an experience like this again in my life, of playing a character across, across such a length of time. And I've always wanted to preserve those aspects of the characterization that people are drawn to, but take responsibility for inventing new things and new um, opportunities for exploration, new flavors and, and colors and insights um, which I hope is why he's still around. Can you share with us where, when you'll be playing him next? Will we? 
Is there anything you can say about that? Can you be a god of mischief and just uh, break your NDA or whatever? <laughs> I mean, I think I'm allowed to tell you that we're doing a second season. Um, and, um, so I'll be doing that shortly. My hair is not short. So, you know. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around and listening to our conversation. I want to thank Tom Hiddleston, Kate Heron, Michael Waldron, and Natalie Holt, whose music you can hear at the end of this week in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Thank you.